Hi, uh, we're uh, Andrew Bauman and James Hibbard, and we are part of the Neuron team at Seattle Children's. Uh, and welcome to our presentation on translating models to medicine, uh, an example of managing visual communications. Uh, during this presentation, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the Neuron team and project, our mission, vision, aims, and challenges. We'll be discussing our solutions approach, and we will demonstrate an example of managing and delivering a visual communication. Uh, the team Neuron and Project Neuron is focused on supporting patient care in the ICU. Our vision is to achieve the optimal clinical outcome for every critically ill child. Uh, and our mission is to lead the development of personalized pediatric critical care uh, by creation and refinement of predictive, analytical, and other decision support tools. And we do this by engaging uh, multiple disciplines uh, to foster uh, rapid uh, innovation, uh, promote uh, the measure, promote and measure the adoption of our methods, and provide novel training in their use and interpretation. One of our specific aims is to enable Neuron's mission by delivering insights and information to our users in a manner that reduces their cognitive load. Uh, so if you look uh, to the representation on the right, uh, you'll see uh, our user uh, uh, in the green circle surrounded by devices. Uh, in this case, this would be, uh, cons uh, this would be a, a neurologist uh, in the ICU who might be consulting with other physicians uh, regarding a patient's care. Uh, so with, within that discussion, uh, they might need uh, pieces of information that can help uh, inform uh, their decisions. Uh, and that the form of a display layer on end that's accessed through a variety of devices, uh, consists of information like a visualization that uh, compares uh, patient uh, treatment trajectory to uh, that they belong to, so what medicines they're on, what proportions they're in, and when administered, uh, the underlying data that informs those visualizations, as well as, uh, for example, visualizations uh, associated with uh, fluid balance management, uh, uh, maybe risk scores such as uh, sepsis risk forecast, uh, respiratory distress uh, risk forecast, uh, or uh, you know risk of crash forecast. So from the example that I, uh, user story that I just gave, that's an example really of a primarily within domain uh, uh, communication. So your knowledge barriers within, you know, that clinical care space uh, are going to be a lot less than say between the clinical care space and the engineering or, or data science uh, space. So that's, that's largely what comprises our challenges uh, as a team. And it's not, and, and also as an organization, and, and probably this is not unique to our, our team or organization. So tech challenges uh, uh, are, are not insignificant, uh, but they can, you know, things like handling volume and velocity of data uh, or supporting uh, uh, data scientists with a platform uh, and maintain, maintaining those tools and platforms are not nearly as significant as the knowledge, knowledge silos that can exist between domains. Uh, so th this, this comes up particularly in trying to transfer uh, from the clinical domain into oper uh, operationalizing uh, that knowledge uh, via engineering. And so without overcoming those knowledge silos, you're not able to make uh, full use of any of the technical challenges that you have overcome. So you can't fully realize their value. So examples of uh, these knowledge silos uh, or knowledge barriers might consist of clinical models uh, or other types of models that are trapped uh, in the literature or in SMEs heads. Uh, and, and this may come in the form of, uh, also come in the form of model code implementation and ETL, which are tightly coupled. Uh, and, and also in tribal knowledge surrounding critical information and artifacts. So these are fairly surmountable within a domain because people from the same domain often speak the same language and, and they can work together to overcome some of these challenges. But when you're trying to go between two domains or multiple domains like we are, uh, you, you really have to make uh, an effort uh, to overcome those barriers so you can fully realize the value of the knowledge base that you have. And, and so this, this is essentially what this slide is saying is we really, in order to fully enable our team, 
and to fully realize our value, we really need to uh, work on processes and technologies that help us uh, go from a state of between uh, domain knowledge silos uh, into uh, a domain into a state where we can all freely communicate with each other and 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 share each other's knowledge. So one of the ways uh, that we do this is by uh, implementation, uh, or is by using classic design patterns to implement a loosely coupled, uh, a framework that consists of loosely coupled layers and entry points that play specific roles. So I discussed the uh, display layer, uh, which would deliver visualization, visual communications. Uh, there's a layer, there, the framework uh, has a layer to uh, communicate or coordinate the other layers. Uh, a very important part of the layer is the model layer, uh, which helps us track model experiments and performance. Uh, registered models or visualizations to a catalog or registry uh, and helps orchestrate deployment. There's also you know, uh, classic components such as uh, a middle data layer, uh, which helps us um, extract source data and perform transformations uh, needed for uh, specific use cases. Uh, and a layer which helps data scientists and data engineers uh, contribute knowledge and, and uh, information uh, into the framework via the model layer and the middle data layers. So how do we use this framework? Uh, we use the framework to capture models, artifacts, and domain and tribal knowledge. Uh, and and then to transfer that to standard, transparent, traceable workflows. An example of that would be uh, mapping uh, concepts uh, from a clinician uh, to visuals that help inform their decisions and reduce their cognitive load when trying to process information about a patient. Uh, we then turn around and deliver, deliver this as discoverable, extensible, and portable end products. And here, these are some of the technologies that we use uh, to implement this framework. Uh, uh, our model layer consists of uh, largely of, of ML flow uh, with some of our own code in the form of, of Bookkeeper. Our middle data layer is primarily comprised of Spark, uh, Delta Lake, and Blob Store. And our display layer uh, in, involves a number of elements, um, particularly in our prototype layers. Uh, but these include Tableau, Altera, and Vega Lite, Power BI, uh, Streamlit, and React.js. What process, uh, we follow a, uh, we follow and are continuing to develop a process which leads us from uh, research to production. Uh, and that includes defining and documenting uh, information found in the literature and uh, gained through uh, subject matter expert interviews. Uh, decoupling base models from the specifics of their implementation, providing support for further development and maturity. Uh, say, for example, a model that takes in an instance of data and gives a risk score for that particular moment versus one that might forecast that risk score uh, several hours into the future. Uh, and also, uh, we focus on centralizing tracking of development, knowledge, and communication to enable discovery. Again, our, our model layer plays a large part of that uh, work. Um, we deliver models visually, so we deliver these and communicate these models as visualizations. Uh, and examples of models that have uh, uh, we've recently worked on in our framework uh, include uh, a model for pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is a scoring model. Uh, and predictive NEDOX, which is also a scoring model, uh, which helps plan um, emergency department staffing. In this case, we actually uh, use a machine learning algorithm uh, to forecast our score uh, two hours into the future. As I mentioned, uh, our model tracking layer is very important and is a large part of our focus. Uh, we use MLflow uh, for this tracking layer, but we've also wrapped it in our own Python package, which we currently call Bookkeeper. Uh, so we do that so that we can um, easily customize MLflow uh, for our use cases. Uh, um, and also are able to uh, extend that uh, via the uh, Python plugin system um, so that we can meet our use cases without having to manage uh, actually changing MLflow itself. 
Uh, and some of our customizations and extensions include UI customization, uh, custom models and workflows, uh, such as uh, being able to register visualizations in the model registry, uh, and high level search and deploy uh, convenience functionality, which is built on top of the MLflow model API. And, and in particular helps us build things for front end use uh, so that you can search out specific types of, uh, of models and other information from the registry. Neuron has been uh, really focused uh, on respiratory health. Uh, so that includes uh, PRs, risk monitoring, as I mentioned before, monitoring uh, ventilation use, and even aspects of fluid management. Um, we're currently uh, capturing the PRs pipeline uh, using the process which I described previously. And uh, we can't share that work right now. Uh, so in order to demonstrate our process and uh, in managing our visual communications, uh, we have a hypothetical scenario of mapping ICU, uh, mapping ICU beds. Um, and we'll show you uh, some aspects of how we've encoded uh, visualizations as specifications in JSON, uh, how we capture that with MLflow and render them with Vega Lite, uh, how we simplify visual communication management by using the MLflow model registry, uh, you know, our discovery and deployment uh, of models using custom high-level search and deploy classes, uh, and then also how we actually pass data uh, via fit or predict functions uh, to our deployed spec in order to render it, render those visualizations. And now uh, James will take over uh, and uh, walk through uh, our scenario. So we have a subject matter expert who wants to uh, have a visualization that uh, conveys the number of ICU beds available in the area and their availability for new patients. So they want to display this as you know, a dashboard somewhere where others can uh, look at it and very quickly capture information about uh, capacity and make decisions based off of that. Uh, the subject matter expert knows a whole lot of information about uh, hospital census, hospital bed census, and how to uh, how that will affect care. Um, but they can't convey that all on their own. So the first thing that they would do is they go to our registry, and they just do a brain dump. They would create a new experiment around the ICU bed communication, and they would describe the scenario of conveying these ICU beds and how many are available. And then they might dump additional information. Uh, I used the term hospital census. You know, that would be domain specific jargon for saying, you know, how many beds exist and how many are available. So terms like that might be uh, defined here or at least be available for other people to come through from other domains and say, I'm not sure what you're trying to convey here. Can you define it? And so they might do additional uh, uh, steps like attaching research papers to define terms or sources. So once that initial capturing of the scenario has occurred, uh, another team member would make an initial visualization of the hospital beds. and register that visualization as a model. So here we see in our model registry that we have three versions of this hospital bed census uh, tracked as three different versions of a model. So what each of these versions uh, represent is a progressive sharpening, a progressive improvement of communicating this piece of information from one of those knowledge silos to another in a way that is more broadly usable by the organization to support uh, patient care. So maybe uh, version one, um, the experts in visualization have just enough knowledge, just enough understanding of the scenario to you know, have a map of the geographic region with dots representing the hospitals. And this we can look at that and say, you know, that's a great first step, but it'd be a lot more uh, digestible if you map the size of the dots to the number of ICU beds. If you encoded availability by you know, having a color encoding. 
And so then the person who works on visualizations will go and update uh, the model for mapping that chunk of data to the visual. And so that process will go back and forth. You know, maybe the version three here is an enhancing of that color encoding to better um, communicate that availability. And we're able to do this rapid uh, iteration and this rapid mapping of data and concepts to a visual communication uh, because of how we have packaged up these visualizations as models. So this is part of our uh, bookkeeper extension. You'll see here that we have uh, registered a specification for generating this uh, visualization as a model itself. And we've highlighted here um, that the data that's passed in is uh, uh, choosable by the user. Uh, here we have a placeholder value. Uh, and we're able to define what the visual will look like here as a specification and render it. So just like you have a model that takes data in and predicts some value, we have a visual communication as a model that takes in some data. And when you call predict on it, puts out a uh, visual. And what this allows us to do is we use our toolkit that we've developed and others have developed around uh, uh, creating uh, models in the kind of data science space and apply that to these communications. Um, so we can track uh, our visualizations, we can search them, uh, with different uh, criteria, the same way that we might search through an MLflow uh, model registry uh, for models that meet uh, uh, certain criteria or that uh, answer the problem that we're posing. And we're able to select a visual representation and then independently pass in a chunk of data that we want to interpret. So here we have an example of a user uh, pulling a visual model and passing in some cars data. And obviously no dots representing ICU beds are rendered. Um, this is just to show that um, the data and the visual spec are independent uh, and that um, you can pass in any data, but um, our visualization spec really encodes how that information will be uh, turned into a visual. So here we see they passed in some hospital bed information and they actually get a visual representation. And this visual representation carries along some of the intuition that the subject matter expert had, you know, uh, larger size to have more ICU beds, um, location around the region they cared about. And so as these visuals get improved and iterated on, uh, we're able to use the same uh, model deployment uh, procedure that we use for machine learning or statistical models to deploy our visual models. So here we can go from uh, production stage to our version two of our model to version three. And all downstream systems will pick up on that change and uh, display the current best visual representation. Um, and so uh, that's great because um, it has one point of control for updating these mappings and uh, distributing them across the organization. Uh, so here we have sort of kind of our version three of our ICU bed mapping. And, uh, you know, a, a lot, we've, we've accomplished quite a lot here. Uh, we've made a, a visual spec that's independent of the data that we've passed in. And that spec is a model for translating raw data to a visualization that carries a lot of our subject matter experts like intuition about the system. Um, we've, we're not trying to convey all information that we have about hospital beds and their location and what hospitals they're in. We're trying to communicate the most important pieces of information. So it's really home to transmit a certain message and to allow a non-expert to pick up on that message. Um, we have a tooltip here where we can allow a user to start to investigate 
uh, more detailed piece of information about hospital beds and hospitals that we've highlighted with visual. Um, we are hoping to, you know, you're never going to have a non-expert meet 100% of the same understanding as an expert, but this allows a path for us to allow, you know, 60, 70% of that kind of initial intuition. And that allows people from other knowledge silos to have a you know richer discussion about the system and hopefully contribute information that they have from their background more easily. And that kind of leads us to our sort of uh, cheeky term we've come up with for transfer visiting. Uh, so it's analogous to transfer learning. So we're really straining that visualization as model analogy as much as possible. Um, here we see that uh, we have a visual encoding that is great for communicating the ICU bed census information, you know, number of ICU beds, capacity. And we have updated the, uh, uh, the spec of the visual to not just display the geographic region of Washington State, but the whole US. So here we are transferring our intuition about hospital beds and their availability from Washington State to the entire country. And this is great because uh, a non-expert would be able to make that substitution and hopefully have uh, you know, the same sort of intuitions that an expert would have, but now within a different context. Uh, and we'd like to thank everyone who made this work possible. Uh, the rest of the Neuron team at Seattle Children's, our friends at Databricks, and the support we have received from the Lindsay Winnington Foundation, the Davy Foundation, and the Goldman Foundation.